Hey friends, this is day 489 of Russian war against Ukraine. If you're like me, you haven't slept in the last couple of days just watching what was happening in Russia about uh, the insurrection and how promising that was from Prigozhin's uh, point of view and how it ended with a whimper instead of a bang. We're going to talk about that in this uh, overview of the last week. We're going to talk about three things. Number one, we're going to talk about Ukrainian counteroffensive, how that's going, and why there's a lot of speculation in Western media about it's not going as well as it is expected. It's kind of slow. It's iffy. We're going to uh, dot some eyes on that. We're going to talk about, of course, the insurrection of Prigozhin, and, and number three, the story that's still developing about the nuclear power station in uh, Zaporizhia in southern Ukraine, which has been mined, and a lot of uh, analysts and uh, official people are taking it quite seriously. So we're going to talk about what's happening there. So number one, uh, the counteroffensive. Uh, since it started about three weeks ago, uh, the Western media, I usually read The Economist, a little bit of a Wall Street Journal, they're all like, oh, this is not going as expected. And in the beginning, it was uh, it was understood because a lot of people, a lot of uh, the sources that the Western media was using was actually Russian war correspondents or glorified video bloggers, basically, and uh, Russian official propaganda that that was their sources so and of course they were they, they were showing the same tank 20 different ways saying we took down 20 tanks and they came up with these fantastic numbers of ukrainian losses and that the attack had, had really stopped it could not go further that is not true um and uh, and ukraine is not still is not talking much about how how it's going because they need to keep the fog of war in order to achieve success so that's very understandable so when you read anything when you hear any, anything on on you know video on, on tv on, on youtube of, um, of Western media sources, take it with a, with a grain of salt, knowing that the main source of information they're taking is from these pro-Russian pro -Russian sources. Okay, so uh, what we know is is not a lot, but, but Ukrainian uh, offensive is going. In fact, uh, since the Prigozhin's insurrection, it has, it has sped up, understand, understandably, and we were able to go in uh, take more territory, about 500 meters uh, in the last uh, couple of days. Ukrainian army is um, almost all the way to the first of the strongholds. So as you know, in the last eight year, eight uh, months since November, since uh, Kherson was um, taken back in a lightning speed operation, Russians have been entrenching in, in the Western Ukraine, building, uh, building trenches, building fortifications, uh, expecting that that Ukrainian army is going to attack at some point. So now we're coming up on the first strongholds. Um, there was some distance between where the, the zero position is, is where the where the, uh, the uh, Ukrainian controlled and Russian controlled army um, territory is. Now there's some no man zone or, or some cities in, in between. And now we're coming up against fortifications. In fact, that we already know that uh, Ukrainian army, army has been uh, able to take back one town, which was under Russian occupation since 2014. So, so we are taking uh, taking ground. Nobody was expecting that the uh, Ukrainian offensive is going to be lightning fast, like a blitzkrieg, like it was uh, in the autumn of last year. Everybody understood um, that uh, we're going against for fortified positions of uh, of the territory that was under Russian control for, for a while. So we understand that it's not as fast. We have to dig in and, um, and go little by little, taking territory with with a lot of loss. So still not as much as, as Russian, of course. Okay, we did have to change. Uh, we know that Ukrainian forces have to, had to change tactics of, uh, of how they um, do uh, the warfare because uh, there were two there were two surprises, uh, two pieces of, of Russian equipment that were more effective than we originally anticipated. One of them was the helicopter Kav, 52 uh, alligator, which which is basically the barraging, um, the barraging web uh, ammo helicopter. Another one was a drone uh, they called Lancet. So those were um, those slowed down the Ukrainian army. So we we had to change tactics, uh, but now that has been uh, dealt with. What's important and not talked about enough is is in these operations you do not. It's not like First World War, you know, jump out of the trenches and, and go, 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 go. Um, the, uh, the groups that go ahead, they, uh, they first do what's called uh, reconnaissance by, by battle. They, they go into battle and 
by the results of their battle, they learn more about the other side. And in these operations, most of the forces, they call, they call the reserve, are, are held back until, until uh, each army knows where the main battle is going, going to happen. And then they send in reserves as, as reinforcements, and then that's, that, that's how they win. One important thing to understand about Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian and Russian forces here, is that Russian forces have already used a lot of their reserves. So these initial groups had run out, and, um, and the generals on the Russian side have decided that they know where the main line of attack is going to be, send their reserves, but Ukrainians have not used their reserves yet. So it's sort of like a mind game between generals on, on either side of uh, if they can trick the other side in, um, in thinking that we're going, this is our main li line of attack. So they send their reserves there and they get ground down when, um, when the opposing army kind of ta takes the defensive positions. So Russian forces are at a disadvantage right now. In fact, we know this because Prigozhin is saying so before he went on uh, the rec his reconnaissance, uh, sorry, his insurgents mission, he said that uh, there is no way, there's no chance for a Russian army to win uh, because the generals are making stupid, dumb decisions. So we know that uh, the offensive is uh, going forward. It's being successful. It's not as fast. But again, in uh, in eastern Ukraine, we're going against positions which have been fortified the last eight months and the last eight years since 20, 2014. So um, so taking all all, the, all that into account, know that this is this is going um, the offensive is going well. It's not we're not stumped we're not surprised we're not um taking taking a back or anything it's it's uh it's going well ukraine is is suffering losses of course because whoever is is advancing will always uh, suffer losses um but because of the planning uh it's it's not as much as as russians even um even in this situation of course going head to head is not is it's not a good idea it's never a good idea um uh, Ideally, you would you would send in aviation first, uh, and then artillery, and then the the personnel. But uh, Ukraine not having the um, the aviation that we need, sort of have to go that way. There's no ability to flank there either. So unfortunately, more Ukrainian soldiers have to die because because we do not have enough equipment for a uh, optimal or smart way to counterattack. All right, uh, number two, uh, Prigozhin. So this guy, um, a lot of a lot of experts have been last two days have been trying to figure out what happened, and a lot of experts are still they don't know. They're dismayed. They don't know what's happening. They're still asking. You know, there could be a number of versions of what happened, but basically what we know is that this guy went uh, went uh, all in and decided to throw a challenge to President Putin. Um, he recorded this video about how uh, Russian official army, and of course you remember that Chevikov Wagner, which uh, of which uh, Prigozhin is chief, is a, a private militia. They do not, they're not the same as Russian army. So he says the Russian army had shot in their backs and killed, he said, a lot of uh, Wagner soldiers. And now we're going to... Um, on a march of justice, march of justice, he called it. Uh, and so they, they went out uh, and uh, went to the city of Rostov, which is kind of from Ukraine going a little bit south, crossing uh, to, to, to Russian city. They took it without, without one shot. The, the, the army there just submitted. The police, the, all the enforcement structures there just submitted, and they, they were able to take the... Uh, the, the police, the the, the the local White House, which is the sorry, uh, the legislation building, um, and uh, what's interesting about Rostov, it, that's where the coordination for Russian army happens, like the, ma the main uh, center. So he's not dumb; he, he knows where that happens, and and he took that under control, basically choking the supply of Russian army uh, to uh, to advance in Ukraine. And then he he took hostage to Russian generals, and he said, "I I need to talk to the Shoigu, which is the Minister of Defense, and uh, Gerasimov, which is the um, he is the commander of general headquarters of uh, of the army." And he said, and he said that uh, they have been lying to Putin. They have uh, embezzled the, the funds, and and by their actions, a lot of uh, Russian soldiers, as, as well as soldiers of Chivakov Wagner, ha had died. So he said, unless you produce them, I'm going to Moscow. So 
uh, obviously those guys actually run away. Uh, there is uh, there is evidence that Putin had went to Saint Saint Petersburg as well. He was he was really scared. So Putin had started going uh, towards uh, Moscow. Stopped 200 kilometers, which is 140 miles uh, short of Moscow, and then he produced this weird video uh, uh, audio message about uh, we understand that there's going to be bloodshed, so we want to avoid that. So we're we're turning back. Obviously, a bogus reason because. Uh, prior to this, they had shot down like four uh, Russian aircraft, two helicopters, um, two um, battle helicopters, and and, and uh, one reconnaissance and, and something else. So they had already killed a total of like 17 people. So they, he has already shed blood. At the same time, Putin had uh, come out, and I'm not sure if you've seen this. It's it's a funny message to watch. He was scared shitless. And he was uh, trying to look like he was angry and, and control the situation. And he talked a lot, of, a lot of interesting things. Like he mentioned 1917, uh, Russian Revolution. And the question is, why would you mention that? Because the uh, the, uh, the Bolsheviks, the people who had risen, had actually won. So he he didn't uh, calm anybody down. If anything, he had uh, um, stirred people up uh, even more on the way of. Uh, Prigozhin, they, they tried to put up trucks to block his movement, of course, because he had heavy machinery. He was able to push them away. They had started to set up uh, the um, uh, machine gun nests in, in Moscow itself and, and sandbags and stuff like that. So they, they took it seriously. They, the, they understood that Prigozhin, with his claimed 25,000 people, was a real threat. Uh, although what I'm hearing from the experts in Ukraine is that it was more of like 5,000 range uh, because he left some in Ukraine, he left some in Rostov, and then he took his advancement groups uh, with him to Moscow. So that was interesting. Uh, we we know that then Lukashenko, which is which is a Belarusian president, had made some kind of a deal. <clears throat> we don't know what it was, <coughs> and then uh, Prigozhin turned away. Uh, of course, uh, Prigozhin, uh, his main goal was to replace these two guys, the uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov. Uh, for, from their posts because they were uh, corrupting the army and they were, were the reason why Russian army loses. He got neither. Uh, he, he got nothing. Instead of he, that, he was a, he was a guaranteed a uh, that he could, could go could go back to Belarus. And it's unclear what was happening. So we'll see. Uh, obviously, Putin is um, was humiliated because uh, it was an insurrection. And in the beginning, he was like everybody was going to be punished. And they are, it's a stab in the back. They are traitors to our nation. And then he made a deal with traitors. He, he obviously thought that he could not just overcome them. He could not destroy them. He could not neutralize them. So he, instead, he made a deal and let them let them leave. Which uh, to uh, even Russian observers, to Russian elites, to the um, pro even propaganda people, signals that he he doesn't control anything in his country. He cannot control the terrorist activity. He does not even control his own army because the um, because the army in, in Rostov and, and the group stationed there, they just lay down their arms. Um, the um, border patrol lay down their arms. Wagner didn't, didn't shoot any shot to, to be able to take any of these buildings or any of these cities. So um, so Putin was 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 uh, really scared because he he didn't know how this was going to turn out. So he had to make a deal. So uh, we'll see in the next few weeks if uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov were going to be replaced. If, if Wagner had actually had made some sort of under the carpet deal and or not. Or <coughs> but in any case, <coughs> we know two things. One is that uh, this story is not over. More more and more. Experts that I uh, listen to on the Ukrainian side, they're saying that this story is not over because why would Prigozhin believe Putin's guarantees like, and and his lapdog Lukashenko? Like, the, he's he's a dead man basically. He, he would not uh, he he doesn't believe them. He's not that dumb. On the other on the other hand, Putin had borne um, irreparable reputation damage because everybody saw that that he does not control the situation in his own country or the enforcement structures in his own country. And number three we can say is that Prigozhin and, Chivik and the Wagner, the private militia of Wagner, they're not a player anymore. So he's he's out. He's going to be doing whatever God knows what in, in Belarus and maybe go back to Africa. But his group is going to be absorbed into, uh, into Russian army and 
and uh, Wagner was the most effective part of, of Russian forces so far. So now if his guys go back into, uh, into regular, regular Russian army, that means that they are, they have lost their, a lot of their military potential. So we'll see what happens. There's versions that, uh, that Prigozhin didn't really believe Putin and he's going, going to come back and, and the story is not over. Whatever happens, if he comes back or not, the, the Russian, government is not is not going to re recover from this because in dictatorial governments as we have talked before the uh, authority of the leader is what keeps it together it's what gives them legitimacy and now that everybody had seen the that uh, putin doesn't control his situation he doesn't have the uh, the authority in his own country he has to make deals with anybody who has gotten uh, a little group of armed men to march on moscow that uh, legitimacy is now over. So now we're going to we're going to see with time how that deteriorates and and what happens there. In any case, this is probably good uh, good for Ukraine and and good for the world uh, if we can control the disintegration of Russia. Um and then finally uh, we're talking about the Parisia power plant. So as you know, the nuclear power plant was taken in the first day occupied in the first day of the war and the IA IA whatever the 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 European Nuclear Commission is. They have been there a number of times to inspect it. Um, so now the our uh, chief spy of Ukraine, Budanov, he's uh, chief of um, chief of uh, Ukrainian intelligence force or something like that. Uh, he says that three out of the four uh, reactor blocks are mined, and mined in the sense that there is vehicles um, vehicles uh, packed with explosive materials parked by them. And he says there is a pretty high chance that Russia will resort to blowing them up to create a diversion in Ukraine. And, and as we know, Russia is not above that. They have blown up the Kahovka Dam, was it two weeks ago already? Wow. It's uh, so many things have happened since then. Uh, they, Russia is in a desperate position. They do not, they have very little to lose. They're losing their positions in eastern Ukraine. They understand they cannot hold Crimea. They understand that they just almost Im uh, immediately lost, instantly lost their their country to to Prigozhin, who was right there uh, in Moscow. So they're getting more and more desperate. So it's entirely possible that something could happen there that could blow up and to create a diversion to uh, to intimidate the rest of the world. That you know, if you keep sending uh, weapons to Ukraine where this is what's going to happen and we're going to become more and more radical, more and more desperate. So Ukrainian officials, including Budanov, are saying that this this time it's not it's not a mere threat. They're actually uh, a chance they're going to do it. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that situation. And I think a lot of the reason why they're talking about it is because they want to uh, to raise awareness of this problem and to have European leaders, the IA, IA to get involved with, with the situation and stop whatever they're planning. Um, whatever we heard, whatever happened this week, friends, is another reminder that Russia is not a civilized Western country. You should not analyze Russia from the same moral or ethical or even motivational uh, standpoints like they're they're just looking out for for their own or they're seeking more um more uh, of their own interests these guys are on the path to destruction they do not care about anything it's as it's a, it's an, an empire of evil which which must be stopped and if if the kahovka dam if the insurrection in russia had not convinced you of that just watch out. This, what else? What else do we need to understand this, right? So it's it, it baffles me how a lot of people are still saying that well, Putin is is forced to do this. It's not him. It's not uh, that country is a mess. It's a, the they're like bulldogs under the carpet fighting amongst themselves, and um, and uh, the rest of us have have to bear the consequence until the rest of the world steps in. So that's why it's important. That's why no country is isolated from this. That's why every country is in. Uh, immediate danger of what happens in Russia. That's why everybody needs to pitch in and help Ukrainians repel Russia and contain the danger that they pose to us and to the rest of the world. Ukraine will win. Thank you for supporting us. God bless.